now my pleasure to introduce our keynote speaker, Bill McKibben. Bill asked me to keep the introduction short, and I've got a fairly long one here, and I'm not going to read it. I'm going to actually honor Bill's request. You can go to page 19 in your program, and you can see a bio of Bill. But I'm just going to say it's my pleasure to ask you to welcome writer, activist, and Bill McKibben. Ago. 
those seeing those pictures that came back from Apollo 8, you know, the first pictures of the Earth floating in space, they're as out of date as my high school yearbook picture, you know. Um, um, there's 40% less summer sea ice in the Arctic than there was then. I could go on for a long time listing all these changes, and I won't. I'll just talk about what's happened since that book came out 18 months ago, because it makes the case just fine. 2010 was the warmest year for which human beings have records. Uh, 19 nations set new all-time temperature records last year, and some of them were unbelievable. We were on the phone one day with our 350.org crew in Pakistan, and one of them said, it's hot here today. And I was surprised to hear him say it, because it's always hot in the summer in Pakistan, and why would you mention it? And he said, no, it's really hot. We just set the new all-time Asia temperature record today. It's 129 degrees outside. It's like, okay, yes, that is hot. <laughs> when you have heat, like kinds of things start to happen, none of them good. Um, maybe, since we don't have all the time in the world, I'll focus on the single most important set of changes that we're seeing uh, uh, as we warm things. And that's probably what's happening to the Earth's hydrology what's happening to the way that water moves around the planet. If you want one basic fact to understand this century, it's that warm air holds more water vapor than cold air holds, okay? The atmosphere, <coughs> on average, is 4% wetter than 30 years ago. Now that is an astonishing change in the basic physical parameter of the planet. That number had stayed even, more or less, for the 10,000 years of the Holocene. But what Geologists call this period that saw the rise of human civilization a period of great climatic stability. In your lifetimes, we have moved out of the Holocene and into something else. And the question is how far we're going to go. Because warm air holds more water vapor than cold, it means that in dry, arid places, we get more evaporation and more drought. In the summer of 2010, that was Russia that was the biggest example. It had the greatest heat wave it had ever seen, and it so spooked the Kremlin that they stopped all grain exports to the rest of the world. They turned around ships and train cars. In a normal year, Russia is the third biggest grain exporter on this planet. When they did that, it caused the price of corn and wheat to go up 70% almost overnight, and it has stayed there, okay? And for us, 70% increase in the price of corn doesn't help, but it's not the end of the world. If you go buy a box of cornflakes, you pay more for the cardboard than you do for the corn, okay? So it's not like it makes it impossible. If you live someplace where you go out every day and buy cornmeal to make tortillas for your supper, the 70% increase in the price is a big problem. The number of malnourished people on this earth has been spiking the last three and four years. People are starving because place after place, harvests are failing. That drought <coughs> spread to lots of other places. We've seen severe drought in the North China Plains, in much of Western Europe, now in the Horn of Africa, disastrously, and spectacularly, horribly, in the American Southwest. You may get a little rain this week, at least across parts of it, and if it does, it'll be some of the first in Texas in more than a year. Uh, it's been unbelievable there. A deeper drought than the dust bowl. The head of the Texas Forest Fire Fighting Service said two weeks ago when fire was wrecking suburbs across the Austin area, said no human being has ever fought fire in conditions like this. And he was right. The humidity was so low it was impossible. Once that water's up in the air, it's going to come down. Water molecules only stay, water vapor only stays in the atmosphere on average six or seven days. And so what we've done is load the dice for deluge and downpour and flood, and place after place is, is throwing snake eyes in that game. Summer 2010, it was Pakistan that was the most notable. Okay? Uh, uh, that area up in the Khyber Pass, which normally gets three feet of rain in a year, got 12 feet of rain in a week. And that's why the Indus River swelled to the point where a quarter of Pakistan was underwater and 20 million people were out of their homes. You might have seen the pictures from Australia at Christmas time of the mammoth floods in Queensland like no one had ever seen before. 
Same kind of thing going on in places with fewer cameras in Sri Lanka, and Philippines, and Vietnam, and parts of Brazil. We sure saw it in this country, uh, you know, in the springtime when the Mississippi and the Missouri rivers carried more water than they'd ever carried before uh, as record snow melt and record snowpack, which is what you get when you have record rainfall and the temperatures below freezing, as that snowpack melted and combined with record spring rains to send ungodly volumes of water pulsing through that system. <coughs> we saw it spectacularly again where I live in the state of Vermont uh, last month. Uh, Hurricane Irene came charging up the coast and encountered record warm seawater off New York and New Jersey, which allowed it to pick up moisture like a sponge and it carried it inland and dumped it mostly over Vermont. Now, you all are, probably many of you have taken a math course or a statistics course recently, okay? So you'd understand that in a place like Vermont or upstate New York, where you have hundreds of years of rainfall records, okay? If you set a new one-day record for rainfall, that would be highly unusual for that to happen. And if it did happen, it should happen by a millimeter or two, you know, because there have been so many tens of thousands of other rainstorms in our past. There were place after place that were setting new all-time one-day rainfall records of 25, 30, 60 percent. Rain that was falling on a different planet than those old records it accumulated on. That's what's starting to happen, and it's causing unbelievable damage in places like Vermont, but at least in places like Vermont, for the moment we have some money to deal with it, when it happens in places that don't, and it must be added in places that generally have done nothing to cause this problem that we face, because they don't burn enough fossil fuel to matter in terms of climate change. When it happens in those places, people just starve. People have to move, and there's still millions of people homeless in Pakistan. There's no development going on in these places. There's no progress. We're just trying to get tarps over people's heads. Here's what you need to understand. The kind of change I'm describing so far has happened with the rise in a temperature of one degree, globally average about three quarters of a watt per square meter of extra solar energy on the Earth's surface. So we're just at the beginning. There's probably another degree already in the pipeline from carbon we've already emitted. The oceans hold some of that heat for a little while, okay? But eventually it'll get expressed back out into the atmosphere. And the climatologists are robust in their consensus that unless we make Massive change fast, and by massive change, I mean unless we stop burning coal and gas and oil far faster than any government is planning to at the moment. Unless we do that, then we're looking at four or five degrees by the time you guys are old, and most of that will be committed to very quickly, and there is no reason at all to think that civilization can deal with that kind of change. Stanford University of Washington agronomists a couple of years ago just did a study saying what happens to grain yields if we raise the temperature. Corn and wheat and things evolved just like we did in the Holocene. That's what they're used to, too. And what they found was that even before you factor in flood and drought, simply that temperature increase from this point on should be enough to cut grain yields 10% for each degree that we increase the temperature. So you guys know enough about the world by now to be able to make some predictions about what will happen to stability, to peace, to progress, to development, to women's rights, to all the things that we care about if there are 20 or 30 percent fewer calories on this earth. Nothing good will happen. We can't let that world be. We've got to prevent it. It is the most important fight that any group of humans have ever engaged in, ever. Not many people get to say at any given moment on this planet, I'm in the most important place I could be doing the most important thing I could be doing, but you guys get to kind of say that today, that you're in a really important place, and now the question is making sure that you're doing enough about it, that you're digging in with enough leverage to make change on the scale we need. Some of that change has to happen on your campus.
campuses. Okay? We got to get your campuses carbon neutral and fast. Uh, Middlebury said it'll be carbon neutral by 2016. Um, um, we need you guys to be matching that kind of stuff all around the country. But, but even if we could all make that happen really fast on campus, it would not be anywhere near enough because our campuses and our communities are embedded in a larger system that at the moment is not changing. Carbon emissions on this planet went up 5% last year. We just got the new data, the biggest increase ever recorded. Okay? We are sprinting right now in the wrong direction. And there is a reason that that is happening. And the reason has to do with power. I spent a long time thinking that the way we were going to solve this problem was that we would have scientists explain what was going on to our political leaders and our whatever, and that they would make the shifts that would need to be made. In fact, I confess when I wrote The End of Nature, I was 26 or 27, and my theory of change was people will read this book and then they will change. Um, and people did read it. I mean, it came out in 24 languages or something. It was a big bestseller. But that turns out to be not how it works. While those scientists have been calmly talking to our leaders and explaining what's going on, the fossil fuel industry has been bellowing in the other ear of our political leaders and drowning out any of that common sense and reason um, they've been instead issuing the kind of series of threats to people's political careers that have been sufficient to keep action from happening. You could see it most powerfully on display in the U.S. Senate last summer, not this summer, but the one before, when the Senate, still then dominated by Democrats, refused to even take a vote on the most mild, tame, temperate, tempted moderate climate legislation you could possibly imagine. They were so scared of the fossil fuel industry that they would not even take a vote. Okay. That's the reason that we have to do more than work on our campuses because it will not be, in the end, enormously useful to have a series of green islands surrounded by a, uh, a, 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 a heating starting to happen and we're beginning to see them built and you are capable of making them happen. I'm going to tell a couple of stories yeah. really quickly. One is about the work that I've done with my friends over the last few years to build this thing called 350.org. Okay, when I was talking about 350, that number is kind of the bottom line of that equation. In January of 2008, our most important climatologist, Jim Hansen at NASA, and his team published a paper saying we now know enough from looking at paleoclimate data and real-time observation to say how much carbon is too much. They said any value for carbon in the atmosphere greater than 350 parts per million is not compatible with the planet on which civilization developed and to which life on Earth is adapted. That is strong language for scientists to use, and it is stronger still when you know that wherever you are today, in Pittsburgh or Peking or wherever, the atmosphere contains 393 parts per million CO2. They were already way too high. That's why the Arctic is melting and Pakistan is drowning and Texas is burning. So that paper was incredibly depressing to read. It was a kind of acknowledgement that we weren't going to stop global warming. We were only going to stop it from getting any worse than we absolutely have to. But it was also, for a few of us, a little bit thrilling to read. Because we've been trying to figure out how we were going to try and build a global climate movement, something that there really has never been. Okay? And one of the reasons that there never has been is because it's hard to organize things on a global scale. It's hard, among other things, because every 
everybody around the planet insists on speaking their own language, which makes it enormously difficult to talk amongst ourselves. It's hard for even if you have all the money in the world to organize like that. You know, Coca-Cola, um, which does have the lobby, um, um, their current slogan is, Coke is it. Okay. A phrase with literally no meaning. <laughs> and, and the reason that that's their slogan is because their <coughs> old slogan was, there might be people old enough to remember, just a few of us in here, when their slogan was, Coke adds life. Okay? Which is, means a little more, not a lot, but a little. Um, the trouble was, when they put it on billboards all around the world, in many places their slogan apparently became, Coke will bring your ancestors back from the dead. <laughs> this was not an effective advertising strategy. So Coke is it, right? That's just it. We looked at that 350 number, and we said, huh, you wouldn't normally organize a campaign around a wonky scientific data point. However, Arabic numerals do cross linguistic boundaries. Maybe this is our way in. 350 means same thing no matter where you are. It was good we had that one advantage because we had really no others. We had no money, and it was me and seven undergraduates. <laughs> they were seniors, so they weren't they weren't done with school, but they were done with school more or less. Um, and uh, seven actually was the right number because there are seven continents, so each one of them took one, um, and we went to work. The guy who had the Antarctic also had to take the internet because it's sort of its own. <laughs> <laughs> and off we went. <coughs> and our job was to find people like ourselves around the world and try to get them involved and interested. Uh, uh, and most parts of the world, that's not, you know, there's not like a category called environmentalists, but it's people working on women's issues and on food security and on war and peace and on social justice and on development, on all the things you can't do on a cratering planet. We didn't, we, we had training camps with young people in Turkey for Central Asia and in the Caribbean and in Johannesburg. I remember we brought down from pretty much every country in Africa one or two young people. You know, most had never even left their countries before, but they were born organizers and they were great. And we, we, everybody was fanned out across the planet. We knew they were working, but we didn't know, you know, all volunteers, all just, you know, we, we didn't know quite how it was all going to add up. And we said, we're going to take one day, October 24th, 2009, so not quite two years ago. Um, we're going to take that, we're going to make it a kind of coming out party for this number and try to drive it into the middle of the information bloodstream, you know. <coughs> and everybody has to figure out something they're going to do in their place to make this happen. We got the first sense that it might actually kind of work. Two days early, on October 22nd, the eight of us were sitting around a borrowed office in Lower Manhattan, just crowded into one room with our laptops open, writing press releases and things. And the phone rang, and there was a bad satellite connection to Addis Ababa in Ethiopia. Okay, and there was on the other end was a 17-year-old girl named Lily, who we trained at one of these things down in Africa, and she was in tears. She said, "The government has taken away our permit for for Saturday, Ethiopia, not all the nicest government." taken away our permit for Saturday so we can't do this thing then like we were planning to. Okay. Um, um, we're going to do it today before they can stop us. And we're really sorry. And we don't want to jump the gun. And we were spoil it for everybody. And we were so looking forward to doing it the same day as everybody else in the world. And we've got 15,000 young people now right out in Addis Ababa <laughs> chanting 350. <laughs> so I was like, uh, Lily, don't worry about the data. <laughs> <laughs> and then for the next like, three days, these pictures just boom in from all over the world. Before the thing was over, there had been 5,100 demonstrations in 180 countries. CNN said it was the most widespread day of political activity in the planet's history. I don't have long, so I'm just going to show you. <laughs> a few of these pictures and just give you some I mean, the next one that came in was from American soldiers in Afghanistan we got 350 with sandbags and they sent us a note saying we're, we're parking our um, Humvee for the weekend and walking okay yeah. um, um, and but after that it was just like the picture we're kind of following the sun around the world you know as the day began that 
represents the uh, Australian Youth Climate Coalition uh, on the steps of the Sydney Opera House. As, you, as I just flip through these, the main thing I want you to see is who your brothers and sisters in this fight are. Okay. One of the things that sometimes people say, in America anyway, is environmentalism is something for rich white people and that people who have to put food on the table every day and things couldn't be expected to care about so that is nonsense of the highest order. Um, most of the people that we work with around the world are poor and black and brown and Asian and young because that's what most of the world is. Okay? And oddly enough, they're every bit as interested in the future as anybody else, probably more so because the future bears down harder on you. Okay, in those are we getting pictures from places we've never heard of? Places we had. We had 300 big demonstrations across India. That's the India Youth Climate Coalition. Um, uh, places we couldn't identify. Uh, that's someplace in Buddhist Asia, obviously. I just like the picture. Places of enormous poverty. Those are dugout canoes, someplace on the Congo River above Kinshasa. These guys didn't even have a digital camera. They developed it in somebody's home dark room. It didn't come out so well, so they had to write in what their banner said. But there they were in one of the most remote parts of the world, fully engaged in this fight, and the same all over the world, and it was incredibly powerful to see. Istanbul have had big floods, so the universities there, six or seven huge demonstrations like that, you know. Um, incredibly creative and beautiful stuff going on. Uh, that's from the Space Needle in Seattle. Those are the colors of the Venezuelan flag. That's an operating room. Hopefully they didn't <laughs> stop for too long. <laughs> um, um, just people figuring out every kind of um, uh, beautiful, powerful thing to do. Big involvement for the first time from religious communities. Africa, a kind of indigenous traditions behind him in the scarlet. Archbishop Tutu's successor is Anglican Archbishop. <laughs> the head of a huge multi-faith march across Cape Town, Pentecostal school. There's Wheaton College in Illinois. Anybody here from Wheaton? Uh, uh, excellent. Wheaton's most important evangelical liberal arts college in the country. It's Billy Graham's alma mater. It's a very good sign of how people are coming together. I've been in Bethlehem to do some organizing. Not even a really an easy place to get to. It's shrinking quickly as the temperature rises. And, and so people wanted to do something. There were too many military checkpoints in the way. You guys can't see this very far back, I fear, but in, you know, in along the Jordanian shore of the Dead Sea, the Jordanians said, we'll make the giant tree, and the Palestinians said, we'll do the five on our beach, and the Israelis said, we'll take care of the zero. It was beautiful and powerful to see, and things like that place after place. This was an autumn afternoon, uh, 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 so of course, in the United States, that meant there were a lot of football games going on there. The Syracuse University cheerleaders helping us out in front of 100,000 people there. Just place after place after place after place. Um, um, Soweto in South Africa was the heartland of resistance to apartheid. It's really where the anti-apartheid movement was at its highest, the biggest black township uh, in Africa. And, and did that day, they did 350 bungee jumps, but the important part was, the important part was, they strung the bungee line between the cooling towers of a defunct coal-fired power plant, and they sent us a note saying, this is the highest and best use for coal-fired power plants going forward. If any of you have campuses that are still burning coal, okay, this is what you have to into uh, in the next little while. Um, there's my daughter in there just because I get homesick. Uh, those are sap buckets uh, spelling out 350 because we're losing our maple forest as the temperatures warm. 300 big demonstrations across China. Not an easy place to do this. One of them got busted up by the police, but most of them went forward. If you can see that, it's the China youth climate making a human wind turbine, and behind them in Inner Mongolia, the uh, edge of the biggest uh, uh, wind farm uh, uh, on our planet. And just picture after picture after picture like this from our colleagues everywhere. The Maldives <laughs> is maybe the most organized and progressive country on earth because it kind of has to be. It's paradise. People have lived there for 5,000 years <coughs> on 1,200 islands strung across the equator in the Indian Ocean, white sand beaches, trees. Their only problem is the highest point in the archipelago is a meter and a half above sea level. 
chances are they will not make it through the century. But they're doing everything they can. There's the Student Government Association holding their meeting in the lagoon to dramatize their problem. This is an entirely Muslim nation. Its president, Mohammed Nasheed, trained his whole cabinet how to scuba dive so they could hold an underwater cabinet meeting on their dying coral reef and send a message to the UN. Okay? That's what leadership looks like. Um, oh, something has stopped working. Uh, uh, no problem. Uh, we won't, we just, I won't show anyone, so just a sign that I was supposed to stop showing pictures. <laughs> um, uh, instead, we'll kind of use virtual PowerPoints. If I say something, if it's working correctly, the picture will appear in your head, okay? Um, um, the, the power of that day was palpable. It was beautiful. And it wasn't... Six weeks later, we got to Copenhagen. We had a big summit the UN about climate that was supposed to solve our problems. And in fact, we did pretty well. We got 117 nations to sign on to this 350 target. So in 18 months, these seven undergraduates, seven people your age with your same set of skills and abilities, had convinced 117 nations to sign on. The trouble is, of course, they were the wrong 117 nations. They were all the poor ones. Okay? And all the addicts led by us weren't yet willing to do a darn thing, and so the movie did not end the way it was supposed to, and that conference fizzled, and I was afraid that this whole movement would just kind of disappear with it because people would just figure there was no point, but on the last day, we brought 350 young people from all around the world there to Copenhagen with us, and on the last day, they'd done great lobbying, but on the last day, they were all basically having to come up and console me because I was in a bad mood, and they kept, and these were, you know, mostly people from places that are, you know, we have to, and we have to here. They were mostly saying some variation on, well, what did you expect? We didn't think we were going to solve this in a year. We're up against the most powerful industry on earth. We've got to go back home and get to work, and that's what people have done. We had, last fall, another huge day of action. This one, a global work party with people putting up solar panels, and digging community gardens, and laying out bike paths, and at the end of the day, and picking up the cell phone and calling whatever they had. President, Prime Minister, Politburo, saying, look, we're getting to work for about you. That happened 7,400 places, every country on Earth except North Korea. Two weeks ago yesterday, we did the third of these big global things. It was called Moving Planet, and it was focused on transportation. And so there were, in every country on Earth, again, there were people, huge, fast bicycle rallies, mostly, because bicycles are an important tool that we need to engage and because bicycles are one of the few tools that both rich people and poor people on this planet use. And so it's a good way to build this kind of solidarity for what is, after all, the first global problem that we face. These things are all incredibly beautiful. There are going to be lots more of them over the years. We need to build a movement. We need your help to do it. And they're also not going to be enough. One of the things that's become very clear, very clear, is that if we're going to make the changes we need in the time that we have, and the most important of those changes is to attach a price to carbon for the damage that it does in the atmosphere so that we use less of it, if we're going to do that, we're going to have to be as strong as the fossil fuel industry because they have won every battle so far. And the way they've won every battle so far is by using their great advantage, which is money. They have more of it than God, okay? And they've been able, you know enough about our political system to know that it doesn't take that much money to work it and to slow things down and to keep them from happening and to delay and to delay and to delay, and that's what's been going on. So we have to find other currencies in which to work passion and creativity and spirit, and sometimes, frankly, it's our bodies. Sometimes
mining this forest tar sand stuff up in Alberta causes unbelievable havoc. They've already moved, they've only got 3% of it so far, but they've already moved more earth than they moved to build the Great Pyramid, the Great Wall of China, the Suez Canal, and the 10 biggest dams on earth, okay? So if you happen to have been an indigenous living in that part of the world, your world has been literally turned upside down. Okay? So we should have been on it long ago when they asked us to be, but there's always a thousand things going on in the world that one never can quite get to them all. And the reason that I and a lot of others finally got involved this year is that that same scientist, Jim Hansen at NASA, and his team took a paper demonstrating exactly how much carbon there was up there in those tar sands. And the answer is a lot. It is the second biggest pool of carbon on Earth after the oil fields of Saudi Arabia. We raised the temperature of the planet a degree mostly by burning the oil fields of Saudi Arabia. But when we started, when our parents and grandparents started that project, we didn't know anything about climate change. So, you know, there's no moral opprobrium that attaches to that. Now we do know. And if we ne take the next <coughs> Saudi Arabia, and do the same thing that we did before, then we're idiots and worse, okay? Um, there is enough carbon in Alberta that if you could burn it all tonight, which thank God you can't, but if you could burn it all tonight, you would just by doing that, raise the carbon concentration of the atmosphere from its current 393, already too high, to 550 parts per million. That's how, that's what's at stake. <coughs> now, this pipeline has been, um, has been wired to succeed politically. It needs a permit from President Obama before it can be built. Because it crosses a national border it needs a presidential certificate of national interest. And he has said that he will make a decision by the end of the year. We knew that we didn't have the money to fight this. The companies that are building the pipeline, Trans-Canada Pipeline, they poured millions of They found the first, and since the State Department's gonna make a, the first call on this, the first recommendation, they found the person uh, who had been Hillary Clinton's deputy campaign manager, and they hired him to be their chief lobbyist. Not, I'm guessing, because he knew a lot about pipelines. Person after person played. It was done the way that it's always done, and they thought that they were going to win easily. They may win. Betting person, you bet they probably would, but it's not going to be easily because a few months ago some of us decided that it was time, time to raise the game a little bit. That we were going to have to find a different currency and that that currency this time was going to be our bodies. And so, beginning <coughs> in mid August, day after day, people showed up outside the White House to sit in to protest. And the first wave of us were dragged away to jail, and we spent three days in central cell block in Washington, D.C., which is exactly as much fun as it sounds like it might be. <laughs> but it did not deter other people from coming. And before that <coughs> two weeks was over, 1,200 people had been arrested in what was the largest use of civil disobedience in this country in 35 years. <laughs> Thank you guys very, very, very much for that work. And what it did, what it did was, it was kind of like the ante in a poker game, okay? It like got us into this <coughs> game. It made it important enough and visible enough and mediagenic enough that suddenly what hadn't been an issue was an issue and now it's a big issue and the fight is completely on. In fact, is coming to Pittsburgh this week. Day after tomorrow. Day after tomorrow is coming here because President Obama is coming here to speak. And every place that the president has gone for the last two months, people, mostly young people, have rallied to make sure that he understands
understands that we really care about this, that we want him to live up to the promises he made in 2008, that he was going to be a transformative president, that in his presidency, as he said on the night of his nomination, the rise of the oceans will begin to slow and the planet will begin to heal. Since Congress isn't in the way this time, we can make it happen. And we need to remind him that he's got to make it happen. 11 o'clock Tuesday morning, 313 Oakland Avenue is where people are meeting. Now, you, a lot of you aren't from here, so like me, so you'll have no idea where that means. Who is it that's organizing this? Stand up so everybody can see you, okay? <coughs> Stand up out there. sure that you know there'll be leafleting and whatever else so that everyone will know exactly where to go on Tuesday to make a respectful but powerful witness to the president. And if we have anything like the number of people that are in this room today, he will notice and it will matter because we're doing what we can to keep the heat on. The next time we need you and we need busloads of you campus within driving distance is November 6th in Washington, D.C. What we're going to do that day, which is exactly one year before the election, is circle the White House with people. That hasn't been done before. We don't know exactly how many it'll be, but quite a bit, because they're going to make us go out around the perimeter a ways. But it's going to look beautiful. And all people are going to be doing is carrying signs with words from President Obama <coughs> during the last campaign. It's time to end the tyranny of oil, things like that. <coughs> We've got to somehow figure out, I think, how to liberate that Barack Obama from the 2008 election, who sometimes, it seems to me, has been locked up in a basement someplace in the White House with some kind of stunt double standing in for him, okay? We need to get him back. And that may be one of the last big chances to do it. I'm not certain it's going to work, because this process has been pretty wired. Okay? There was a story in yesterday's New York Times that blows my mind. You can see it if you go to tarsandsaction.org, which is also the place to get news about November 6th, tarsandsaction.org. But what that story said was, that the company that wants to build this pipeline, had the pipeline, had told the State Department which companies they would like the State Department to hire to do the environmental review of their project. And the State Department had helpfully hired the number one company on their list, a company called Entrix. And it turned out further that that company called Entrix had done millions upon millions of dollars worth of work for this company, TransCanada Pipeline. It would be hard to come up with a sleazier and more corrupt and less intellectually defensible way of dealing with things than this. Okay? It is almost unbelievable. It's so unbelievable that I had to read it about six times to really make sense of just how gross it was. And I'm afraid that people will just say, oh, this is just how things are or whatever. It is and it can't be how things are. If we let it be how things are, then we have no chance, no matter what a good job you do in your dorms or whatever, changing light bulbs and making all the other shifts that we need, it won't add up to anything if it's also happening in the context of this kind of craziness. It helps me, reading that story, understand why so many of your peers are down at Occupy Wall Street right now, okay? Because there really is a way in which that corporate domination of our political process has made it very difficult to see the way out. We need to occupy Wall Street in a sense because Wall Street has successfully occupied the atmosphere and kept us from doing the things that science and reason and morality tell us that we need to do to have any hope of getting out of this. So this is an exciting moment right now, the most exciting moment in a very long time.
Things are in motion and we do not know how they're going to come out. And much of what's happening is really beautiful to see. I wish I could, I wish I could really tell you, get a sense of how powerful it was to be in Lower Manhattan. One of the reasons it was so powerful, ironically, was because the police department, in an effort to be being there, they said that they couldn't use any sound system. No microphone, no speakers, not even a bullhorn. But it was almost literally on the same page all the time. It was beautiful to see it happen. It's been beautiful for me for the last three or four years, four or five years, to be in motion around the world, meeting people doing this kind of work. Beautiful. It's been a little bit tiring, I confess. I've spent more time in jail than at home the last three months, which is not a good ratio. But, but it's been beautiful because every place that I go around the world, okay, there are people ready to go to work, mostly young people, ready to fully dig in and fight. And they're ready to do it even though there's no guarantee that we're going to work. That's the part that's hard for me. I wish I could tell you right now that if we do all the things that we do, if we going to be victorious, and honestly, I cannot tell you that. There are scientists who think we've waited too long to get started, that some of this heating is irreversible. There are political scientists who think that the odds are too high because there's too much money. If you were a betting person, you might bet that that's true. I mean, we've lost for 20 years, but we're engaged in a way we've never been before. We're changing those odds. I don't know if we're going to win. I have no idea. I know that it's reason enough to be able to get up every day and go to work to say that we're changing those odds because there are so many other people willing to do it. Many of them, as I said before, are in places that have done nothing to cause this problem. And that they're willing to engage with us. I think if I lived in Bangladesh, I, don't th I think I have somebody arrived from the West saying, Let's go to work together on climate change. I think I might say to them, you've done all together enough about climate change. Just go away and leave us alone, you know? Um, but instead, people respond constantly with a kind of really gracious tenacity and a willingness to dig in and an understanding of what solidarity means, okay? And that, I guess, puts a burden on all of us to respond, to step up our game. Because we are in the place where we can make an enormous difference. If we can do things like stop this tar sands pipeline, then we can start to change the trajectory of this fight, and who knows what will happen then. It's always an honor to be in those rooms filled with those people. And it is an incredible honor to be in this room with you all today and know that you are at the heart of this fight. I do not know if we're going to win or not. But I sure look forward to standing shoulder to shoulder with you for a lot of years ahead. Thank you guys very much.